Okay, we're live. So welcome to the Friday Hangout. Uh, this week we have Jenny Dietrich from Armit Dietrich, and we're going to be talking reputation management and brand management, which should be really interesting. Um, I'm Janet Fouts. I'm a social media coach. And let's go left to right, start with you, Adam, and do a quick short intro. Uh, I am the founder and CEO of a small digital marketing and creative uh, design agency called Secret Sushi Creative and the co-host of the Solo Mo Show podcast. And I am Alan Morellis. I am vice president at Armand Dietrich. I get to work with Ginny, and she will tell us all about the business, and I'm sort of a regular member of this crowd. Yay. <laughs> Do you want me to go? Yeah, yeah you're up. Oh, okay. I'm Jenny Dietrich. I am the CEO of Armand Dietrich. I also am uh, the lead blogger at Spin Sucks, the co-author of Marketing in the Round, and co-host of Inside PR. Whew. I'm Janet Fouts. I already said who I am, so we'll just skip right to Steve. Hi, I'm Steve Farnsworth. Uh, I'm on Twitter as Steveology, and I write a blog, the Steveology blog. And my day job is I consult to uh, tech companies to help them to... Uh, become media companies and use content marketing to drive leads and that kind of good stuff. Cool. So does anybody have anything they wanted to share this afternoon, this morning, whichever time zone you're in? I, I do if nobody else has some start. I actually, there's a great uh, video out today by uh, Rand uh, Fishkin who from SEO Moz and, and, it, and it's something that I've, I've believed in a few years. He does a thing called Whiteboard Friday which is always worth uh, checking out and we'll include the link here but he talks about link building basically being dead um, and going back to the old days of, of link earning and he just talked about he kind of does a really nice job kind of going over how a lot of the Google updates in the last uh, six months even like the last 12 months have really targeted to get rid of uh, content farms and, and, and directories and other kinds of things to really prevent uh, spammy content and they've done a pretty good job of it so now it really behooves people not to think so much in link building where you go out and get links but where you really focus on the quality of your content, that it really solves problems, that it's specific, it's well written, it's got a, a journalistic quality, and that's what's going to really going to bring, it's going to connect with the right people, and it's going to be uh, not get you penalized by some of the new Google changes, and it's going to drive the right kind of traffic to your blog. And I and I've always felt that's always been true. Never worry about link building. Never a big fan of it. I, I realize this place, the quality of link earning, always been consistent, and we see that even more now. We will include that link below. Well, I love that link earning. That's really, really a good way to put it because that's, that's really what it has to be all about. You know, the link farming thing is pretty much dead. In fact, um, I'm using a new research tool called eCaren, and they actually filter out anything that could be a link farm from their results. So if you're doing any kind of monitoring, those things don't even appear anymore. Huh. Um, and right, rightly so, I think. Good. Anybody else? The room went still. Uh, so I think Steve and I might, might have talked a little bit. Um, I mean, I think link building, I think link earning is still link building because I think that that was always the right approach to have to have gone uh, regardless. Um, but in talking about CEO a lot over the last year, um, it's very much been along the lines of, of um, when you take a look at what Google's been doing with its Penguin updates, its Panda updates, and a lot of the other features it's doing like, Google authorship markup that uh, is now available. It's been available for you know over a year. All these things lead to one place, which is Google finally really being able to understand more than just page rank. It's able the quality of the actual relationships of the content, and and it's added a more uh, human element. And they continue to say this, but most people, uh, but, but many people for, forget this is that they they continue to say that their underlying. Uh, the underlying best SEO strategy is to do is to produce the best content, not for the crawlers. Right. And now that's even more um, more prevalent than it's ever been because of of all these advances they've got with with their search engine and uh, some of the other tools that they've provided. Yeah, and I really like Rand's site too. You know, they've got a really great way there of explaining things in natural language, and that kind of speaks to the link building that if you are building links into your your site it's because people actually get your content and it's shareable mm -hmm. so I think that's pretty powerful you yeah, have for extra, go ahead for, Steve. for extra bonus points they actually do it's interesting they do two things in terms of, of demonstrating quality of, of content marketing 
their their whiteboard Friday literally is a camera in front of a whiteboard, and it's a small little teeny conference room. So all you see on the camera is just this whiteboard behind them. They use it kind of as a static slide that they talk to like you're doing a whiteboard. So it's a really nice, I mean, it's a very inexpensive, very quick, very, mm -hmm. you know, they just transform into a conference room, into into this little studio. And so that's, and they also then try and scribe the, the audio for, for that SEO uh, impact. It's a great example of good content marketing. Oh, good. That's a very good idea. I wanted to raise something that I'm kind of intrigued with. Um, you Why guys may have seen. It's a good um, idea. I'm writing it down. <laughs> <laughs> She's answering her email. All right, Obama, first debate. <laughs> go, um, Alan, go. You might have seen the mention that uh, Yelp is starting to put banners up now on reviews that they've deemed are being paid for. And if you haven't seen them, they look like this this banner with a red around it, and it's and it's pretty uh, pretty straightforward language. And they're going to put those on the accounts. They're up on nine pages right now. They're putting them on the business profiles that they've checked into, and they believe are paying or good. somehow eliciting false reviews. Good. So they're going to stay up for ninety days. Wow. And I think that this is a really intriguing turn of events, going hand in hand with Facebook. We talked last week about how Facebook is trying to. Um, call some of the fake um, accounts. Remember we were talking about how reach was diminishing a little bit. I think that goes hand in hand, but it raises some really interesting points, I think, and Ginny can talk about this a little bit when she gets into the reputation management. Because when we talk to clients and we talk about managing reputation, we are always encouraging you know, positive mentions, positive client reviews or customer reviews. So there's a very interesting gray area developing out there in how a brand can encourage a positive review and what's going to be deemed appropriate and what one does to help clients and customers prepare for this or deal with it, it should it happen. It's going to be a big black eye on the companies that get those banners. There's no missing them. Yeah, so talk about your really reputation just, management. Yeah, it's very much ties into reputation management. Um, but you know, as we go forward, a lot of what we're doing for our customers is showing them how to work with these tools so that they can create positive word of mouth. So I think this this direction that things are heading in, you know, they're predicting that, what did they say, by 2014, they're going to be like 20% of the reviews are going to be false. I think that was a, a Gartner report that came out. Yeah, so it's a, it's a problem and it's continuing to build and it's interesting to see these uh, companies try to get a handle on it. But Yelp, for example, talks about using an automated tool to go through the review filters. And if you read, there are a lot of complaints about filters that have maybe been either ineffective or judge something wrongly or too harshly. So there, I think there's just a whole can of worms that's being opened here, and it's absolutely intriguing to me. Hmm. Yelp's been a mess for a long time. Yeah. So, yes. so this is uh, Yelp's equivalent of the scarlet letter, I guess? Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> and it's even, it's even edged in scarlet, Adam. <laughs> I know that's the same. Well, you know, it, it, it's uh, it's been going that way for a few different um, networks. You know, the the Twitter has had an issue with fake accounts. Sure. And the squelch. Uh, Facebook recently did that before. You know, a few months before they actually announced that they had a billion people on their network uh, because they were getting a lot of bad press after the IPO. That oh well, you advertisers are getting a yeah. bunch of fake accounts and fake clicks. Right. Uh, and uh, and YouTube isn't really dealing with the fake accounts as much as it was uh, dealing with um, the quality of content um, issues and copyright sure. infringements and stuff. So it's interesting that they're using an algorithm to detect this versus mm -hmm. taking a look at it by hand. Um, but based on what we just talked about with the SEO, he's finding better ways of making the content of higher quality and, and keep down uh, the folks that are kind of gaming the system, hopefully. And there will always be people trying to game the system, clearly. Yeah. Um, I just find it absolutely fascinating because I think that we're, we're cruising into a new area and it'll be interesting to see how it plays out. And then, as all of, for all of us who consult with companies that use these sites or have some involvement, um, I think we need to pay really close attention and, and think it through. Right, Steve? <laughs> right, Steve. Well, he was just, I was looking right at him. <laughs> yeah. Yes. <okay. <laughs> okay, so um, to kind of put that spin on it with a reputation. Don't bite your nails. Spin sucks. Spin sucks. Spin sucks. Spin sucks. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> we, we got that. So let, let, let's talk a little bit about how a company can repair man, um, 
damage that's been done to their brand like <laughs> through this with Yelp because I know a lot of people um, innocently say to all of their customers hey review us on Yelp but I know that if they haven't had a lot of reviews if those people only review their doctor then Yelp tags that as a paid for review and it's really mm -hmm. not true it's it's something that somebody innocently does to help somebody that can actually do a lot of damage and I've had quite a few cases of that with small businesses who have done that type of thing um, they weren't paid for reviews they were just you know asking people to right. help them out mm -hmm. I was I can't remember where I was I was speaking somewhere <laughs> somewhere um, and in the audience was a dentist and she said it wasn't Yelp but it was Google Places and she said that they had had a contest with all of their patients um, to give them it anytime they had like a kiosk set up at the front desk and they asked people as they were leaving to write a review on Google Places and everybody that did they put into a drawing and I think they gave away like a $500 Amex gift card or something and they got in big big trouble for it because Google said no 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 you're paying for this even though they weren't it was like Janet said it was that innocent thing so you have to be really really careful about how you're getting those reviews hmm. well, they got in big trouble they got I think their plate their um, she had her place taken down whoa yeah I mean big trouble wow yeah, and some of that I think is triggered by running the algorithms and saying, okay, you know, this person's getting a lot more reviews than seems normal, um, or getting them all in bulk. Oh, right. And what we tell yeah. clients is to make sure that, you know, if you're going to review us, then review some other places too, <laughs> so that it's not just us, because that's yeah. one which of the interesting. Flags. But which is interesting because that makes that um, a much more difficult tactic. Yeah. Because the average bear might, if they're really passionate about a relationship that they have with a brand or with their dentist or doctor or attorney or whomever, they might be willing to do it for them. They're probably not going to be willing to go out and write, write a bunch of other reviews unless they're one of those people that's already doing that. You, right. you know, I had had a, an unusual experience with my mechanic who I really like, great guy, doesn't know anything about the internet. Um, I actually went to, he started getting stuff through Yelp and so I offered to... Uh, go and look at his site and just fix it up for him. It's not something I, I normally do professionally, but he's a really nice guy and I like him. So <laughs> I logged on to his account and, and fixed it for him and you know, kind of did some SEO stuff. And I thought, well, gosh, you know, I really like him. I'll write a review. So I, I review stuff on Yelp all the time. And my review was, was filtered. So mm -hmm. that suggests to me that they're tracking uh, IP addresses too. So oh, interesting. Like, yes, know, they I, are, as a matter of fact. Yeah. Yeah. So, because it was... I didn't do anything. I mean, it was truly a, a sincere review. I liked the guy. Yeah, yeah. So, hey, I, I, I see. Go ahead, Steve. Sorry. No, no. I was actually going to ask something else of Jenny. I, I was just going to say, in relation to this, I think understanding, as with all these systems, what is the algorithm, right? And and what are the rules? And hopefully, they're some somewhat transparent with it. Not to the, in the sense that it allows folks to game it but so that we can understand the decisions that they're making in order to uh, tag something as uh, you know, a paid uh, or blacklisted or whatever you want to call it review. Um, and, uh, and then the other thing is, is uh, hopefully they, they, the way that they treat it, you know, have you ever had anybody like suddenly use your credit card number or anything? If you've ever had a financial issue where your bank does either one of two things, either they warn you, and then mm -hmm. you can talk to them and you can deal with it accordingly or they suddenly shut down your card and we're like that thing right. is dead it's burned it's in the furnace you've got to hold, come here and call us and we'll get you a new card and so in the in the case of Yelp and some of these other guys um, I think it really also depends on are they flagging it and then telling you look this is what we've got going on yeah. you've got to change it or are they just completely throwing it in the garbage shutting down your places page and uh, and telling you you know you're, you're, you're out of luck um, and hopefully it's it's obviously someplace in that middle well I think that I think that this illustrates just this this sort of brave new world that we've entered and there are the rules aren't known you know you can speak specifically about Yelp you can speak specifically about Google places or you can take it and and broaden it even farther and there's just that um, whether it's the, the legalities of it or the different rules for the different sites I mean it's all evolving and it's really interesting I don't think anybody really knows what the parameters are. We sort of instinctively know when something is 
wrong, perhaps, but in the case that Jenny just cited, the dentist's office, I wouldn't have thought that that was such a crime. I right. would have thought that it was a pretty straightforward tactic for um, a small business to use. I thought you know, it was kind smart. Of like, yeah, I thought it was <laughs> right? Yeah. right. 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 Hey, Jenny, I actually have a question. I just, just given the, the, your work in reputation management, um, in, in terms of like, you know, we, we're really aware of some of the, the big cases like the Kenneth Cole where there was an inappropriate tweet or um, KitchenAid kitchen, kitchen last week. We hear about yeah. those, but I suspect that either professionally, I don't know how much you can talk about your own clients, but um, I would love to hear if you have an example of somebody who wouldn't necessarily think that they were at risk of reputation management, what happened and kind of what they did to deal with that. If you can um, you have an example. <laughs> I have a really good example. I can't say who it is, but okay. um, we we have a really good example of a, a client that is creating a for-profit. I gotta figure out how to, how I can talk about this. <laughs> They're creating a for-profit organization in a nonprofit world, and because of that, they are up against regulatory issues. Um, the nonprofits, of course, feel like they're going to put them out of business because they're for profit and making money. Um, and it's been really interesting. When they first started working with us in March, um, their big concern was that there was one negative review on that kept, that kept coming up on the first page of Google. And so one of the reasons they hired us was not only to put a, a marketing strategy in place, but also to have a crisis communication plan because they were concerned that anybody who Googles them has they you it's it was like the third listing so it really was how do we create really good valuable content that isn't going to get going to get rid of that review but push it down in the search results and it it took a while i mean it probably took 6 months but now when you google them it doesn't come up so from a from the perspective of people googling them to figure out whether or not um they are a legit organization. They no longer see that review unless they go to the fifth or sixth page, which is great. But we're also facing this big um, regulatory issue with the government, and so we're really prepared for what could happen um, if people get all up in arms about it. And so we're doing a, a lot of pre-work around that because um, they're doing a big launch in April. And so we're doing a ton of pre-work around that so that if when that happens, and we suspect that there will be lots and lots of very passionate people um, up in arms about it, that we're prepared for managing that reputation. I, I'm curious now if somebody has like a um, a company and they don't something happens. There's uh, some negative reviews and it starts catching a little heat and getting pick up, and and they don't already have a pre-existing relationship or they don't have the bandwidth to, to hire an agency like like yours. Can you talk about a process that uh, the the business owners listed and they haven't done it? You know, again, they didn't do any kind of preparation, but they find themselves in the middle of something starting to grow. What what process or steps would you suggest they they go through to help respond to that those issues? You know, a really good example of this is the guy who bear hugged the president when he came into his rest oh, his pizza right. restaurant in Florida. Yeah. yeah. Um, people from all over the country started writing really bad reviews on his Yelp page. Oh man. And I mean, horrible reviews. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I looked at some of them and took a couple of screen grabs just so I would have them for, for posterity and for um, presentations. But holy cow, people were awful. And people who have never been to his restaurant, they were just, you know, creating these bad reviews. And what he did is he called some of his really good customers. And uh, I mean, now that we've had this conversation, this probably wasn't the smartest thing to do. But. <laughs> He asked them to write good reviews, and when a few of those started to happen, other people who were good customers of his saw that, and it started to catch on, and they all started writing good reviews as well. So it sort of squashed it a little bit, but I thought it was a really interesting way of not having an agency, not having somebody on staff that's a marketing or communications professional, but just really going, holy cow, this is really affecting me and my business. What, what am I going to do about it? And that's what he did, is he called some really good And then it was and interesting, it was, because that story got picked up. Yeah. And it was through all over the place. Yeah. And so, <clears throat> so because I remember reading about it, you know, so people, he actually got a lot of response from well beyond his geographic area Yeah. as, as that story got picked up. Yep. Well, and, and isn't there a difference between asking people and inviting people to write uh, speak their mind about your business versus paying them for those reviews, right? Sure. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. 
Yeah, I think you know, there's actually a great uh, example too. We we have lots of examples in, in the social media of, of of goodwill that you develop through being engaged online. And there's an example of, of goodwill being engaged in real life, and right, yeah, that right. paid off online. And so I I think that the um I think that for businesses one of the I, I think a real reputation issue is we now as customers really expect. Uh, so much more from folks, and it's really important to deliver higher quality service everywhere because we do live in a social web world. Well, and not yeah. only that, but building your community of brand ambassadors because, I mean, the more time, the more you do with customers, and you can be a small business or you can be a gigantic business, but people are going to get mad. They're going to be critical, and if they're critical about you online and you're not responding to that, that's a big problem. And there's so many, you guys know this, there's so many tools that allow you to be really effective about just listening to what the conversation is. And if somebody says something, all, most people, unless they're a troll, want to just have you acknowledge the fact that there's a problem and you're going to fix it. So oh, absolutely. that's really what it's all about is listening and monitoring, paying attention to what people are saying, and building that community of brand ambassadors so that when something does go wrong, and something will go wrong because we're human beings, we're not perfect, that you have something to fall back on. Well, and I think something that you guys have all mentioned um, is, mm -hmm. you know, if you do a, a darn good job for the customers you do have, the, that's your best buffer when yes. something like this goes south, right? Yes. So you just talked about this individual who, had this go south for no reason other than people just wanted to be trolls around the uh, around the web because of political reasons or whatever the case may be. And then what did he do? He relied on all the customers who would not have done anything for him had he really not been providing a you know a good service right. uh, at his at his business. And, and good so pizza. Uh, exactly, it, <laughs> it's amazing what a good pizza can do. Um, <laughs> speaking speaking of uh, a, a funny instance where you deal with something like this, uh, you know, due to the uh, town hall presidential uh, heavyweight bout, I mean, debate that happened uh, <laughs> last week, um, I don't know if you you heard about the um, Avery Binders reviews on, yes, on, on Amazon. Amazon. I love it. Freaking brilliant. And They're awesome. Absolutely. I didn't get a lot of time to read I, through all of them, but I, I saw where they were going, and, and it's like, it's not necessarily... It's not. It's not good, and it's not against. I believe. I don't think any of them have, are against Avery. No. But where does that start to pollute the, the the pool a little bit? The well, you know. Well, yeah, you know, I know that that's a reference to the, the uh, Mitt Romney saying "binders full of women." Yeah. But yeah. I don't. I'm not aware that the the, uh, the binder reviews. Can you talk a little bit about what that is? So they, I mean, they, it's just. Uh, I think it was. I don't know if it's on many products, but I know I saw at least one. It was Avery binders on Amazon. And you had all these people talking about, like, you know, uh, I love Avery Binders. This is where I keep my, my, my women or, or, or something. <laughs> just, and there were a ton of them on there. Uh, Jenny just shared a, a link so we can take care. You know, I'll let you take a look at them. Maybe I'll do some uh, interpretive reading of a few of them here. <laughs> <laughs> um, let's see. Let's see. Uh, let's see. Uh, this, this, th here, here we go, Janet. Sorry. This is just no, fun no, no. interesting. This is a one star that they've given to the Avery Binders that says, This binder is lazy and simply can't get it, uh, get it to take responsibility. 47% of the time it thinks it is entitled to things like health care and food. <laughs> Plus, it is too small to be meaningful. It can fit it, it, uh, it can fit a few women in government in Massachusetts. The other 150 million women are ignored by this binder. What the heck? How are you supposed to... <laughs> that is a one-star review. And so they've all gone there. <laughs> and uh, let me find another winner while you guys are... Uh, uh, here you go. This binder is only 72% as good as the binder full of men. It should only cost 70 <laughs> It should only cost 72% as much. Doesn't this binder know its place? It totally shouldn't get guaranteed contraceptive care and a right to privacy. What the heck is this little binder thinking? One-star review. And how many reviews now does this thing have? 959 reviews. Oh, jeez. There were 300 this morning. Holy cow. With three oh, and a half wow. stars. So, so that's, a, that's an interesting reputation issue. There is a, I don't know if you guys are aware of the body form. Did you guys oh, try yeah. Yeah. So the body form had a, uh, a gentleman wrote on body form is a woman's uh, product. And 
Thanks for clarifying that. Do you want one of us to explain what it is, Steve? Yeah, you know, well, Steve, you always say you want these things elaborated on the show. I, I know. I, I don't know if it's appropriate. Um, but it's, it's, it's this, this guy wrote, uh, just offhand, just kind of a little fun, wrote on the, um, the, the website about how uh, the commercials basically use a lot of imagery and metaphors. And he just kind of says, you know, I find that that's not really true for my wife at that time of month. She doesn't do, you know, uh, rollerblading and extreme sports. <laughs> and, and you lied to me. And so that was on October 8th, and I got about 86,000 um, uh, likes on it because it was just, it was just lighthearted. So the CEO, of all people, about, within about eight days later, they actually filmed a online response to, to Robert. And she just basically goes, Robert, you're right. We've lied to you. These are what we call metaphors. There is no extreme. There's no parachuting or extreme sports, and and they go on just to do this really kind of. It, it, they match the tone, and this was released on the 16th, and and, and as of today, uh, three days after, uh, or two days after, and it's got like 200. Uh, it's got two million views, hmm. and here's an example of someone. It wasn't really a crisis, but an opportunity. The right. company company did a fairly risky video, um, and and funny. And I have to say, the CEO is an hysterical uh, lady. She does an incredible job. Well, and the best part about it is, you know, in the commercials where they pour the blue liquid on to show yes. you. <laughs> at the end, she has a glass of blue water and she drinks it. I mean, it's it's freaking brilliant. It's freaking brilliant. Yeah, she pours the water at the beginning of the commercial and the end she drinks it. It is hysterical. <laughs> it's, it's well, I'm definitely gonna have to put these links on the. Uh, so. Uh, I'll share one for uh, there's a there's a great uh, um, there's a guy who did a nice little breakdown of it. I'll share that link uh, with the group. So so uh, here here's a winner for you. This one is a five star review. So this changes everything. It's entitled <laughs> "There Once Was a Man Named Mittens." All right, there once was a man named Mittens whose women were playful, all playful as kittens. He bound them all in an Avery bin and only had to pay them a pittance. Oh wow. Wow. So, and, and there's and there's comments on this as well where this is turning into like blog comments with threaded responses here. Right. Uh, you know, somebody saying seriously question mark. Other people are saying awesome. This is these are not reviews anymore. You know what I mean? No, it's not. It's not reviews. And yeah. Then what point does Amazon call yeah. a halt to it? Or, or yes, I think that's a great question. I was just thinking, what do you do if that's happening? I mean, I, I love theater, and that's that's funny. But at what point do you start worrying about the damage to the review system? Yeah. Well, a good example of that is Reddit, right? Do you guys know the story of the... Um, Uber uh, troll? The, the Uber troll that was called out by Gawker. His name was... Violent was released. Acres. Violent, uh -huh. Thank you. <laughs> I wasn't sure how to say that. Violent <laughs> Acres. Um, and, you know, Reddit's whole thing has always been we, we have these... Uber user moderators. All of our content is generated by our users. We are pretty lax about things. We have freedom of speech. It's entirely up to you what you want to do. And now, of course, Gawker has come out and said, we discovered who this guy is, and we've published his name. And so it's been a really interesting case study in what Reddit as the platform does about this, because there were people that were banning Gawker. There were people that were banning this guy. I mean, it, was, it has created, in the last week, a ton of controversy. But it's a really interesting case study about what the platform does, what, especially what, what? where they've been so lax about moderating. He, what was, what, what? His subreddits were things like um, posting pseudo-pornographic images of chi not children but teenagers. Ooh. Yeah, I mean, he created basically any offensive thing to the max. I mean, it was like one for rape jokes, one for yeah, um, you know, teen stuff that was like you said, borderline. I mean, racist jokes, people beating up, you know, uh, hobos, whatever the thing was. It was he, he was creating these, and he was uh, nobody knew who he really was, but he almost became like this star that was hiding behind his computer producing all this content for folks uh, and, and Gawker found out who he was as a person and once that happened he lost his job, you know, he's been flamed right and left and uh, I mean, in my opinion that's the way it works once you finally um, you know. Well, yeah, because he was, he was also strong arming other people within the Reddit community. I mean, he was one of their enforcers. So he was not only creating content but he right. was also taking right. a very active role in policing the yes. content that other Reddit users were sharing. 
Okay, so to bring that back to the reputation management part of the discussion, um, at what point does a community manager say, okay, enough, we're yeah. not going to deal with this, or, Pending. you know, because to me, I always tell people anything that's negative on your, negative comments are an opportunity to engage. Sure, In right. this case, okay, it's a troll, but at what point do you say, okay, we're going to ban you from the community because you're too negative? I mean, I you, you, you have, you've it got you've got different. your policy, right? It's it's all up to right. your policy, right? But I think that highlights it, it. You know, we were talking when Steve mentioned the story, um, or we talked about um, the the women's product and how they jumped on this opportunity. Um, I think it kind of highlights something that a brand and an organization, pretty much anyone, has to be thinking and monitoring. It goes back to the monitoring, back to the listening, but also understanding what it is you're trying to do in this space so that when an opportunity presents itself, you can jump on it. And you can yeah. look at something and you can actually respond um, either defensively if that's appropriate or with humor if that's appropriate, but that you're paying attention, you kind of know what you're trying to do in the space, and you're prepared to take action, which implies a certain amount of organization behind the scenes, whether it's a very small company or a larger entity. I, I think that there's a lot of danger. You have to be careful about. You said defensively, and I think you probably meant it in a different way than than being defensive. Because I, I know that we uh, there's a lot of examples when people have gone out there, responded, and gotten to basically little fights online, yeah. which which never weren't. Yes, you're right. Yeah. I did. And, and, not and I assume that you mean by defensively, you know, going out and just correcting like right? that's not action. true. Right. Yeah. Right. Here's the yeah. real situation: is responding to it. Because right. it's, it's really easy to take things online real personally. Mm -hmm. Things go down a rat hole quickly, mm -hmm. and it's preserved forever, and people will share it forever, and you just don't want to have an no, argument thank online. Thank you for clarifying that, because that's yeah. you're absolutely right. That was not what I meant, but I, I was yeah. thinking in terms of responding in defense of the situation in a more strategic fashion. Uh, you know, in, in terms of, like, looking at uh, when it's a good time to disengage with somebody or ban them from a conversation, I think it's when, when you know, we mentioned the guidelines. It really is somebody's saying offensive things and they're not really participating in a, an offensive by, uh, by a, a fairly generous thing in terms of you know, yeah. using swear words that people find offenses or, or that kind of stuff. Um, that long as somebody's willing to engage, that's one thing to keep them involved. When they stop engaging and they just use it as a platform for hate or, right. or that kind of stuff, right. that's, a, that's a time to, to, to remove them. Normally, I think that communities like Reddit, Reddit's actually a pretty good community for most things. It, they actually, there's a lot of fairly bright, uh, folks in Reddit, and they're they're pretty quick about coming in and, and kind of arguing multiple sides of a, of a point. Mm -hmm. and, and and a community that is normally pretty healthy will weed out people who are kind of the the trolls. But when it does get bad, you know. Yeah. I, I was thinking with this Reddit thing more about um, because I believe isn't Condé Nast still um, they're the owners, yes. right? Yeah. And, and so that's what I was thinking more about was do they want to be associated right. with with this kind of content? If Reddit was an independent startup or independent company by itself, still then that's one thing they you know but when you start to be associated with a, a larger um, media brand like that uh, where do you draw the line on how that might bleed into your overall reputation as a company that's a really good point sure by association um, but to look at that from Condé Nast standpoint okay if they moderate this one and they don't moderate that right. one over there right. now they've got an issue yes. so where do they draw the line from their own liability standpoints you know, maybe they moderate this guy and they don't moderate an anti-Muslim person or they don't, you know, any kind of hate speech. Now they have to moderate everybody or they've got bias. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think actually, you know, in Reddit's, uh, I, 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 there are two pieces here. You're talking about what the organization does. Now, in the Reddit community, uh, it, if for, and anybody's ever used it, it's basically kind of a, a, a bulletin board of shared links and photos <laughs> and stuff. So there's, there's a lot of conversation going on, and they have moderators to, to do that. The community itself does a pretty good job weeding out stuff, and I think that open discussion and, and allowing people to hash things out are going to limit most of those issues. And I know there have been issues with uh, photos of questionable ages, and they're very pretty strict about that stuff on Reddit. I, I doubt that Connie Nass is actually going to come in and, and, and do one one thing, because that probably would be it would it would it would do the opposite for them. It's better just to go back and see how you can support the people who are already doing moder moderating and the other the rules that they already have, and just make the community itself stronger and let it manage self manage. Because 
people are always going to do a better job talking about what's offensive, what's not offensive in that group. And yeah, that's kind of majority rules, but that's a better thing than allowing one small group to dictate what's okay and what's not. There, there's two things that I want to see if we can lead us through still with the reputation management. One is, um, you know, you guys were talking about how you can take uh, negative uh, negative publicity or, or, or something that's happened negative and kind of spin it to turn it into something positive. And I think when it comes to that, there's yes. been some, there's been <laughs> some, well, there's been some, uh, some, some creative reputation management on the part of, of the president currently where something might be mentioned in public and uh, his social media team grasps onto that and creates things like images and other pieces of content that kind of play off of it. You know, they did that with the, the Clint Eastwood in the chair thing, and I think was right. with, with a couple hours they had a photo on, on Facebook and other places that said, this chair taken. Um, so I think it's really interesting how they, how they took that uh, and, and, you know, tilted it in their in their favor. Um, the other thing is is uh, I tend to think of um, how you approach sharing and resharing, curating and sharing content as uh, a form of reputation management in the sense that uh, I, I commonly tell people that any content that you share um, uh, that is you know either your your own content or even uh, more so other folks content um, you are endorsing it, and it's felt as an endorsement by the folks that you share it with, and you can actually, um, uh, you can alter and mold people's per perception about you uh, based on that content that you share, and so part of reputation management in that sense is to pay attention mm -hmm. to what you're sharing and not just do it blindly and assume that, you know, if I'm, if I'm a, a, an athlete, who suddenly finds out that the shoes that are, are I'm, I'm endorsing are, are done in a sweatshop and that particular brand is getting uh, a flack over it, are they suddenly going to come and, and uh, after me? Is that going to have an impact on my reputation? Right. So I'm just endorsing a product that somebody else created. I didn't actually create it, but I've, I've, I'm, I'm, I've been put into association with it. That's a really good point because you have to think about you as a brand. And I know there's a big debate about whether or not people can be brands, um, but you still, whether or not you believe in personal brands, you still have, it's still your reputation. And if, you, if you're being, using your name or your presence as part of an endorsement, then you have to be really careful about those things. You have to be really careful about it. For example. <laughs> hey. Hey, Somebody Jenny. think of a brand. Of, of well, a brand. I have a good example. I mean, Triber, which I love, and uh, you know the guys who created Triber are good friends of mine. They you know have <laughs> both. I like them both. <laughs> um, they put my face on their homepage without asking, and <gasps> it was. Did they really? Yeah. Yeah. And oh. So I had a little conversation with, with Dino and I said, look, you know, I don't mind because I'm a, a fan and I like what you guys are doing, but if, you know, what what if they'd have been Michael Jordan's face or Brad Pitt's face? Like, you just can't do that, so you have to be really they, careful. And I did let them did. keep it because I'm, I am a fan and I do like Tribal. You let them keep your face? <laughs> yeah, I let them keep my face. <laughs> Her face. Well, that was bad. But it's a good example. Well, either yeah, and there are actually three other big famous other big bloggers like yourself. I mean, Mark uh, Mark Schaefer was on there, Ted Rubens, and one other person I forgot who. They, they, they use they those photos. Not, they did not ask. Well, I know they didn't ask Mark because Mark and I had the conversation. So. Uh, hey, Jenny, before we go, is I, I'd love maybe for you to kind of kind of back in the archive of, of stuff that you've done, and if you could share maybe one of your favorite reputation management stories. You know, one of my favorite is Red Cross. Um, Last year, it was about the same time as the Chrysler F-bomb tweet. Um, somebody from the Red, Qu Red Cross Twitter account tweeted something equally offensive, and I loved how they managed it because they came out and they said, oh, crap, we did that wrong, and we can't believe that we did that, and we're Wasn't human beings. Was it the beer tweet? Was it what? Was it the yeah. beer tweet? Get yeah. slithered. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and I just really liked how they handled it because it was it was really well done. And it wasn't, you know, we're going to fire this person because they made a mistake or anything like that. It was, hey, we all make mistakes. It was an accident. Let's move on and move forward. And, and somebody just, for, <laughs> somebody may not remember that story. It was, uh, 
somebody was tweeting from their own. They thought they were tweeting from their own account. They were about to say some beer time to go drink something. Time to go get slithered. <laughs> and, and, and I believe that the the slithered part or the beer name was mentioned. And and Red Cross had a very good humor. I happened to be at the conference with the uh, uh, social media person with Red Cross when that happened. Um, yeah, was, oh, great. Uh, yeah, she that's what it was. Is you were you were you were <laughs> yeah, it the was your <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and they responded really well to it. And, and it was funny the beer company in question actually went on to then do a blood drive. Wow, uh, I didn't know that. That's yeah. Oh, that's cool. I didn't yeah. know that. Cool. You know what, it, it, Steve? It sounds like what happened is you were at that conference and you saw an <laughs> iPhone sitting there. And you it up and you're like. Why has this got a red cross Never logo on the back of this? Let's go Never. out and get slithered, right? <laughs> okay, so then why doesn't somebody tell a reputation management story of you know where the brand handled it very poorly for contrast? Well, Kenneth Cole for sure. Did they, they do were... it on purpose? I Sorry? think he did. I think he did do it on purpose. He never actually said whether or not he did, but I think it was one of those controversial I believe all publicity is good kind of things, and I think he did do it on purpose. But I oh. but it blew mm. up his face. Yes. Well, did it? I mean the, que the question is is, is uh, my understanding is their traffic doubled the next month. And website. so did their sales. So I guess yeah. that kind of blowing up is not necessarily bad. Yeah, I mean when you're creating controversy, it's, it's not necessarily bad. Yeah. Yeah. All press is good press. Then, yeah, it, it succeeded. I but think we it we was we, we talked about this a little bit. Remember, Steve, when we went to the uh, the recent event here in Palo Alto, where on stage they were talking about do people do these things for the sake of yeah. of increasing sales and such? And and the response, and and rightfully so, was you know you might be able to do it once, you might right. be able to do it twice, right. and make it feel like it's it's, right. it's on accident or or whatever. But eventually, it right. becomes part of your your brand reputation. Yeah. Right. You know, I, I, you know, I think in terms of, uh, of other really bad, a bad example of uh, reputation management was the Nestle thing, and that's and right. Nestle. Right. You know, there is a group, uh, a, a an, uh, an ecology group, which was taking Nestle to task. I remember for, that. Yeah. For for their palm oil uh, collection or farming or something, and mm -hmm. and they started doing these logos. They used to take the, start taking the logos and and uh, the Nestle logo and doing their own interpretation. So Nestle went logo cop on them and said you're not allowed to do that and they got in this very public fight and they were closing people out and it just you know it was it really just it made it much worse the more they focused on it the worse it got and and it just made the experience for people who were other fans of Nestle very negative as opposed to kind of letting it burn out and not making a big deal and ignoring it letting the the, the letting the um, other fans handle it they just made they made a, a mash of it Mm -hmm. Yeah, if you respond sometimes it's worse than not responding. Um, yeah. And you know, it goes back to the same thing that if you've got a really good community, right. your community will right. will save you. Right. If if you have a good product, if you have good services, and I think one important right. point is that you know, a good reputation campaign isn't going to save you if your products are crappy, if your services suck. You know, so don't expect that um, that that's going to fix everything if what you have to start off with isn't good. You know, you know it, it actually, I know, I know we're running out of time, but it, it, I think we live in a day and age that we can no longer, back in the old days, I mean, I used to be in PR, Jenny's got that background. Um, I think that back in the old days, you could, to some degree, use PR to get yourself out of bad sure. reps. I'm not sure unless you actually fix the problem. Today. Yeah. Yeah, I don't think it's the same. That's because you were in control of the information, right? And, right. and now you that control that can, the messaging, you control everything. You control and, the brand, you control everything. I mean, this goes to the SEO stuff we talked about, and pretty much anything that we talked about here is that the best form of reputation management is just having a kick-ass company with kick-ass service and a kick-ass product, right. Right. and eventually you have customers who think you kick ass and they want to um, they want to tell other people you, and right? they want to defend you and all those sorts of things, you know. And it doesn't solve every single situation. But ha not having that, uh, you, you might as well just let the water uh, come into the boat and slowly sink, you know? <laughs> hey, before yeah. we f forget, I want to make sure, Jenny, if people want to find you, and I think they, I strongly recommend they do, how can they find you? Uh, Spinsucks.com is probably the easiest. I'm there every day. <laughs> we have links to a lot of Jenny's work. We're going to link to the videos that we discussed today. 
on the FridayHangout.com, so people can go and watch the live stream there, and they'll be able to get those links as well. Um, and at this point, we should probably wrap up. So anybody got any last brilliant thoughts they want to share? Everybody goes quiet. It's not. It's the brilliant part. It's the brilliant part. Just, just rewind the video. Just rewind yeah. the video. There's <laughs> lots of diamonds in there. I do, I do have one question. Yes. Adam, what's on your wall? Oh, this is actually, oh. it's actually good. Uh, can, you, can you identify them? I cannot. I just see, oh, Spider-Man, Spider-Man, Batman, Superman. Ninjas. I don't. See, I can't see who the other two They're, are. They're uh, Iron Man, Superman, Batman. Uh, now I've got to remind myself. Wolverine. Nice. And they're all in. Uh, they're all in the. Uh, what is it the called? Lotus. The meditation pose. Lotus. <laughs> Though that's what it is. Their lotus. Their lotus pose. So that's the. That's awesome. That's the, the human side and the geeky side all wrapped together. <laughs> Love it. <laughs> I think we're going to have that asked by every single guest we have on the show every Friday now, right? Well, yeah. <laughs> I'll tip them off before I invite them. <laughs> okay. I've always wanted to like start switching them around. There's the artist has a whole bunch of them. I'm just going to like randomly change it and be like, what the heck is going on? Those are super cool. <laughs> and superheroes. And, and superheroes. Um, Alan, fun. do you want to tell us about next week's show? Yeah, next week we have Danny Brown from Jugnu coming in to talk about uh, social CRM. Nice. And his tool. And it oh, ought to be very interesting. Will we have a translator so people can understand, Danny? <laughs> We're going to do subtitles? Yeah, I'll be here to Excellent. try to help. Okay. <laughs> it's true. He's not joking. This, this just in, Danny Brown was watching the last show and is not appearing on the next show. <laughs> <laughs> All right. I'm going to go ahead and wrap up the broadcast. If you guys want to hang out for a second and uh, talk about the show, that would be great. And thank you very much for coming. Uh, Jenny, we really appreciate you. I appreciate the rest of you guys, too. Oh, so, uh, <laughs> everyone but Steve. <laughs> there you go.